we, we got some rain and then God brought us some sunshine. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. No place I would rather be than in the house of God. Our enemy will try to draw you away, try to keep you away, because he knows that there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to know that name. He doesn't want you to declare that name. And as pastor preached this morning, you are not alone. He wants to make you feel alone. Mm -hmm. But we know that God is on our side. Amen. I love how, how God works. Pastor and I do not share with each other what we're preaching. And over the last couple of weeks, our messages have been going together like hand and glove. And this is just another case of that. When Pastor sent me his, his scriptures and his title the other day to be ready to place it into the computer, I took and I glanced at his title and I quickly flipped away because I didn't want to look at any of his scriptures. I didn't want to see what he had because I knew where I was going with my message and I wasn't done yet. So I didn't want his message to influence mine. My mess our messages are not alike, or they're, they're not the same, put it that way, but they are alike. And the songs that we sang today, I urge you today to open your heart, to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. You are not alone, and God is on your side. If we can turn on our Bibles this morning to the book of John, Chapter 11. John chapter 11. I don't know about you, but I feel the Spirit of God in this house today. The Holy Ghost is here. John chapter 11, we begin reading there at verse number 1. It says, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, in the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, him, him who thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Let's move down to verse number 11. It says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Down to verse number 17. It says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary still in the, sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your hand upon our lives today, for your blessings upon us, Lord, and for your voice that speaks into our hearts. God, I ask that you would anoint my mind today, O Lord. Anoint my lips to deliver this message. 
Let the every ear be anointed to hear your voice, God, as you speak to those that are assembled together. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for every blessing that you give to us every day, and we give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. According to legend, and po quite possibly even fact, the story goes like this. A chess grandmaster came upon this intriguing painting while touring the Louvre Museum, where it hung along other famous art, such as the Mona Lisa. In this painting, it depicts Satan playing chess with a man, and the wager was the man's soul. The painting is called Checkmate. As depicted by the painting, the man has no moves left and is agonizing over having just lost his soul to Satan, not wanting to lose. When the group that the Grand Master was touring with moved on to other pieces of art, the Grand Master of Chess stood studying this painting. And after some time, the tour guide noticed that the Grand Master was no longer with the group and went back to encourage him to keep up. The Grand Master replied that he couldn't help it as he was a Grand Master of the game of, that was depicted and was studying the board. So, replied the tour guide, well, as you are not a Grand Master of Chess, I don't expect you to see what it is that I see, replied the Grand Master. And what exactly is it that you see, asked the tour guide. The Grand Master replied, this picture is titled Checkmate, which indicates that the man lost the match. But in studying this board, I see something. What is it, asked the tour guide, now getting impatient. Well, what I see, said the Grand Master, is that the king still has one more move. And that's exactly what I would like to preach to you today. The title of this message today is One More Move. If you feel like you have reached the end of your rope, if you feel like there is no place left to turn, if you feel like the world has turned its back against you, or if you feel your life has been flipped upside down, or if you feel like you are never going to win the battle, I declare to you today that the king still has one more move. He's got a move to make in your life that is going to give you victory. He has a move to make in your life that is going to give you a breakthrough. He has a move to make in your life that is going to set you free. He has a move to make in your life that is going to make all the difference in the world. And you may not see it today, but the king is still on his throne and he still has one more move. Lazarus was sick and Jesus delayed his trip to go back where they had laid him to that place where Lazarus had died. When Jesus finally got to where Lazarus was, he was greeted by Martha, who declared unto him, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. God, if you would have just come when we called you, if you would have just turned your trip and made your way to this place, you would have been able to heal his body, and he would not be laid in that grave right now. He would have been healed. We know we have faith in you. We believe in you, and we put our trust in you, Jesus. But you failed us. You let us down. You left us alone, and he died because you were not here. But then paraphrasing what Jesus said to Martha, Jesus responded saying, I know he's dead, but I still have one more move. I still have this opportunity. I still have another chance. I still have the ability to work something in Lazarus' life that is unexpected to everybody assembled here today because you have gathered around to mourn his death, but I have come here to raise him back to life. And he declares unto Martha, move that stone. In John chapter 11, carrying on now from where we were reading, beginning at verse number 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. 
I believe that Jesus did this because he wanted to make sure that they knew he was dead. Nobody lays in a tomb for four days and is just sick in their body. Nobody's going to lay in a tomb for four days that they just put there by happenstance, that there was going to be no chance that Lazarus was alive on his own. He was making sure that Lazarus was dead. And he said, I want you to take that stone away. Carrying on, Jesus said unto her in verse number 40, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe that thou shouldst see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from that place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And we had, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And then when he spoke those words out of that grave, comes hopping Lazarus, still bound in his grave clothes, still bound like they had placed him in that grave, all still bound up the way they had left him. Jesus had one more move left. And he worked that move on Lazarus' life and brought him to, to life out of that grave to prove who he was. He said, if you would just believe that you would see the glory. I remember reading years ago about a man, he was, he's a Pentecostal man. I want to say from Brother Stone King's church, I might be wrong on that one. Diagnosed with a brain tumor. And he went to his doctors. He went through treatments. He went through all these different trials and things that were going on in his life. And he kept going and kept going. And he kept believing and he kept praying and he kept having faith that God was going to heal. He felt in his soul that there was a reason why God gave him this tumor, but that God was going to heal him and God was going to receive the victory out of it. To the point where he, had, he was preaching in a church some, someplace nearby. And during that, while he was preaching, he had heard that another church close by was having a healing service. So he finished up the service that he was preaching and he got into his car. I don't remember if it was across town or just down to a neighboring town, but he wanted to get there to that healing service. He wanted to get to that place where he felt like God is going to do something. And he says he walked into that service as it was almost ending and he said he just felt something when he walked into that place and they said that uh, they were going to open up the mic to anybody that believed that God had touched their body. And that man said, he goes, I didn't really feel like God had taken this, the tumor away from me. I didn't really feel like God had brought me a healing, but I just felt this urge that I needed to go and take the mic, that I needed to declare a healing that God was going to do in my body. And so he said he went up on to the platform, and he took that mic, and he declared the fact that he believed that God was going to heal him of that tumor. And instantly he said he felt the power of the Holy Ghost come over him, and he started dancing around the stage and he dropped the microphone and he danced around and he left that service and he went to his next doctor's appointment and the tumor was still there. God hadn't done anything to that tumor. And he said he felt defeated and he felt deflated and he questioned, he's, God, where are you? God, I know that there's a purpose in this. God, I know that you've got to have a plan in this. God, I know that you're going to do something in my life, and I don't understand what it is because you're not doing anything right now. I don't know if you're hearing me right now. I don't know if you're going to heal me of this tumor. I don't know if I'm going to die because of this tumor. And he said his faith was wavering, and he was, he was going down into that pit of despair wondering what was going to happen until he got right to the place where they, the doctors had no more choice. They said, we have to operate on you. We have to open up your skull. We have to get into that tumor and we have to remove it from your brain. And the doctor walked into the hospital room before the surgery. He says, I got to be honest with you. This is not an easy surgery. He says, there's a lot of things that could happen during this surgery. Number one, you may not come out of it. You might die during this surgery. Number two, you might come out of it, but you might be paralyzed. And this man, he's thinking, he goes, I'm a musician, I'm a drummer, I'm a preacher. The doctor's giving him this list of things that could go wrong, that he, he might be paralyzed, he may not be able to talk again. And there are all these things that he, he might come out completely different than he went into it. But God, where are you? 
And he says, I, I have to go through the surgery. So he signed off on the papers, and he went into the surgery. He came out of the, when he woke after the surgery, he was playing music in his mind. He had been dreaming that he was behind the drums. And they said that when he woke up, that his foot was moving to the beat of the song that he was thinking in his dream that he was playing. And he woke up from this and he, he felt like, oh, God, God, God's done it. He's, he's taken this tumor from me. He's finally worked this in my life. He's finally helped the doctors and I came out of it and I'm all going to be okay. And then the doctor walked back into the hospital room shortly a little while later and he comes in and he says, I've got good news and I've got bad news. He says, well, what's the good news, doc? And he says, well, we removed a really good sized tumor from your brain. He says, well, what's the bad news then? He says, we couldn't get it all. He goes, we would have killed you if we would have cut the rest of the tumor out. So I've still got this cancerous tumor in my brain. The doctor said, yeah, you do. So they got to praying. And he's in that hospital room. And he's praying and he's praying and they're praying and they're believing God. God, you've got to bring a healing. You've got, we know that there's a purpose behind this God. Our faith is so strong like we believe in you, God. And suddenly he went into this coughing fit and he says, and he coughed up this chunk of what he said looked like a piece of burnt hamburger out into onto the, the bed sheets in front of him and they looked at it and they didn't know what it was and they came and nobody could be able to was able to tell what it was and then he went in for another scan shortly a couple days later and they did the brain scan the doctor walks into the room and says i got something to tell you he goes that cancer that we left behind is gone there's no evidence of it. We can't see it. We can't find it. It's no longer there. In that man's life, the, God was allowing him to go through this trial. God was allowing him to have his faith shaken. God was allowing him to go through every little piece of this. But all along the way, God was just saying, just hold on one more minute. Just hold on for another couple of days. Just hold on just a little while longer because I've still got one move left. I still can work something in your life. It's not over yet. I'm still here. I'm still on my throne. I can still heal your body. Just don't lose your faith in me. Don't lose your trust in me. Keep believing that I am a healer. Keep believing that I can deliver. Keep believing that I can do this in your life. You see, if no matter where, what's going on in your life, no matter what's happening deep down, whatever's happening in your life that's trying to shake your faith, you just got to keep on believing, saying, God, I'm going to trust in you. God, I'm going to keep believing in you. God, I don't see what the outcome is. I don't know how I'm going to get there, God, but I know that you still have another move left. I still know that there's another opportunity. I still know there's another chance. I still know that there's something that can be done in my situation. When the Israelites were led out of Egypt... And they got to the Red Sea and they realized that they were being pursued. They cried out to Moses. They were thinking, well, this is checkmate. Moses came into Egypt. He marched up in before Pharaoh, said, I want you to let my people go. And God continued to harden Pharaoh's heart. And then he, we went through all of the plagues. He did all the things. God kept hardening Pharaoh's heart until finally got to the place that God came in and he killed all the firstborn children. And finally he softened Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh said, okay, take your people and go. Get away from Egypt. Get out of this place. So all the people gathered all their belongings together. They took everything they had. The Egyptians gave them gold and things to get them on their way and said, go, get out of here. And they left, and they thought, okay, it's freedom. Then they come along to the coast of the Red Sea, and, and some of the people may be looking back. Maybe they saw that cloud coming. Well, what's going on? Mo? What's going on? The Pharaoh's coming after us now. He didn't really let us go. It would have been better for us if you'd have just left us there, Moses. It would have been better if you'd have just left us in our bondage that we were in. In Exodus chapter 14, Exodus 14, beginning at verse number 10. 
It says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou that dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die out in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you this day. For the, king, for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no, no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Right. What Moses was saying in this was, fear not, because God still has one more move. Fear not because God is going to do a miracle today. Fear not because God is still here. God is still in control. It was God that sent me into Egypt to pull you out, and God is still directing our steps. He is still guiding our path. He led them out of Egypt by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And he took them up to that place, and he's saying, God brought us this far. He's not going to let us die here. He's not going to let us be turned back. He's not going to let us be recaptured because he still has one more move. He went into that place, and that's when God had, Pharaoh, had Moses lift up his rod, parted the waters as they crossed over the Red Sea when they got to the other side, and they turned around and they looked, and there, behold, there comes Pharaoh following after them. And they waited till Pharaoh and his armies were fully into the Red Sea, and then God said, bring down your staff. And when Moses brought down his staff, along came the waters and took out Pharaoh and his army. See, God still had another move, and God used it. It was not checkmate, but he still had that victory. You need to believe that when your back's up against a wall, when you think you've got no place left to turn, when you don't know how to get out of whatever situation that you're in, you just look towards heaven. Cast your eyes towards heaven and say, God, I know you're on my side. God, I know that you are still in control of my life. I know that you are still in control. You still order my steps. And God, I'm going to put my trust in you. And I'm going to believe you, Lord, for that one more move. And then trust in him to have it come to pass. When Elijah took on the 450 prophets of Baal, when he stood alone amongst the multitude. I want to stop there and I want, us to, I, want to, I want to bring that to our lives today. We're not a lot of people in this church. Well, oftentimes where we go, when we, when we go to work every day, if we're going to school, whatever it is that we're doing, we're alone. We're not compassed about by uh, all of our workmates being Pentecostal, having the same beliefs that we do, thinking the same way we think, trusting in the same God that we trust in. We go out into the world, we're alone. We're going out against the enemy every time we go out. We're going out into a place where people are going to be against what we believe. They're going to be against what, how we act, and they're going to be against how we live our lives. We are alone out there, and we're alone every place we go. It's the only time that we come together is when we come into this place, when we can join together to be unified in this house. But when we go outside of these walls, we are alone, just like Elijah was alone. And he came against these 450 prophets of Baal, and he stood alone amongst them. You need to be ready to stand and declare, thus saith the Lord. Because when you do, and you put all of your faith in God, as Elijah did, then God steps into the picture. God, just like Pastor preached this morning, you are not alone. We go out physically, we are alone. We go out amongst people, and they don't believe what we believe, but you're not alone because God is right there with you. He's right there beside you. He's right there to direct you. He's right there to help you. He's right there to strengthen you. You see, Elijah knew that even though he was one against 450, God still had one more move. It didn't matter that he was outnumbered. It didn't matter that he appeared to be alone on that day. That when he said, I want you to pick out your, your sacrifice. I want you to build your altar. And I want you to call upon your gods. And then, who's God? I'm going to do the same thing after you're done. And whoever's God answers by fire, that's the God you serve. 
He wasn't afraid to stand there as he watched as they picked their sacrifice. He wasn't afraid to stand there as they built their altar. He wasn't afraid to stand there as they began to call out to their God, as they began to do things, began to cut themselves, do all these things. He got to the point where he wasn't even afraid to ridicule them because of what their God's lack of response. One man against 450 prophets of Baal, and he stood there believing in his God. He stood there trusting in his God, knowing in that moment that God was right there with him. And God answered by a fire. God demonstrated his power. God stepped into the picture because whatever your situation that you face, when you, can't, when you feel like you're all alone, when you feel like everybody's against you, just trust in God. Right. Just believe in him and call on him. If you can't think of where to turn, I declare to you that God still has one more move. We oftentimes get into that place where we think that there's no answer. We think that there's just no way. That there's nothing left in our lives. I've never been to that place. But I know many people that have. When they get to that place where they think all that I've got left is to take my life. I got to get out of this life. I got to get out of this situation. I got to get out of this pain. I got to get away from everything that's gone wrong in my life. And they've got no place left to turn but just to end it all. Sister Waylage, I'm pretty sure it was Sister Waylage. She was a Sunday school evangelist that came to camp couple few different years I believe it was her that told the story her husband is a preacher and they were out preaching out he was evangelizing and they were in this church and she said in this one service there was a gentleman that came in the back door and he came in and he sat kind of in the back corner kind of where Jack is sitting there <coughs> nobody paid much attention to him because he was scruffy he'd been sleeping on the streets he was dirty wearing rags, had a big overgrown beard, his hair was all long and matted and tangled and dirty and he probably stunk. So people probably avoided him. And at the end of the service, Sister Waylage's husband gave an altar call, asked people to come up to the front. They needed the Holy Ghost. They asked people to come up to the front if they needed some redemption. They asked people to come up to the front and come and repent of their sins and this man from whatever it was that this Brother Waylage preached, whatever it was that, that drew him. But he got up from the back of that church and he made his way to that altar that day. And he got down on his knees and, and started crying out to God. And God in that time filled that man with the Holy Ghost. Sister Waylage says she didn't remember any of that. But she said it was about a year later. She said that they were still evangelizing, still doing their thing, and came in, and they might have, I don't know if it was the same church, but they came into a church service, and she said that this great big man come up to her, and he's wearing a suit, and he's clean cut, and really nice looking man, he's this bigger man, and he comes up, and he just comes up, and Sister Waylage, and he wraps his arms around her, and gives her this big bear hug, and she's kind of like, whoa, okay, who are you? And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. She, he says, you probably didn't recognize me. But she said, he goes, a year ago, I was in a service that your husband was preaching, and he says, and I made my way to an altar, and God filled me with the Holy Ghost. He goes, but what nobody knew was in that day, he goes, I had hit rock bottom. He said, I had no place to turn, no place to go. I had lost everything. I had nothing. He goes, and I was just so full of despair, and I was just so full of anguish. And he goes, and I, I, was, I didn't know where to turn. And he said, and I was going to take my own life. And he goes, and then just the thought came to me. He goes, I'm just going to give God a try. I'm going to give God a chance. And he goes, and that was the first church I came across. And he goes, and I snuck in the back door, and nobody wanted to sit near me. He goes, because I stunk. 
and I was dirty, and my hair was matted, and it was long, and I, I was uh, in horrible shape, and, and nobody would even come near me. Nobody would shake my hand. Nobody would talk to me. Nobody would do anything. He said, but when that altar call came, I just felt compelled to come up to that altar. He says, I got down on my knees, and I began to pray, and I began to cry out to God, God, this is your last chance. God, this is the last opportunity, God. If you're going to do anything, God, you've got to do it today. And he says, and God filled me with the Holy Ghost. Because, you know, he still had one more move. He still had another move to make in that man's life. And he says, and be all because of that message that I heard, all because of that, that pole that brought me to a church service, because of coming to an altar and God filling me with the Holy Ghost. He goes, I turned my life around. He goes, and now I'm doing well. And, I, and as you can see, I'm here, I'm wearing a suit, and I'm, I'm dressed nice, and I've got friends in the church, and and I'm still alive today because God still had one more move. The enemy wants to destroy us. The enemy wants to take not just our life, but he wants to take our soul. He wants to destroy us so that we have never have an opportunity to spend that eternity in heaven with Jesus. You see, when Satan beguiled Eve in the garden, and then watched as God expelled them so that they couldn't have access to the tree of life anymore. I imagine Satan sitting back. <laughs> My plan is working. They would have lived forever in that garden. They would, have, they would have been there forever in this beautiful place. But now I've destroyed them. I've won this battle. Then later on, Jesus would be born. He put into the minds of the people on that fateful day. As Pilate stood and said, I can release to you today Jesus. He's an innocent man. Or I can release to you today Barabbas, this killer. Which do you want me to release today? And they cried out, Barabbas. And they said, well, what should I do with Jesus then? And they yelled, crucify him. The innocent man. And as Satan watched as Jesus took the whipping, the beating, his clothes stripped from him, the mocking that he endured, the plucking of his beard from his face, the plating of that crown of thorns onto his head so that blood would be running down his eyes, the blood running down his back. As they was, Satan watched as he dragged that cross up to Calvary where he would soon die. Satan would have thought, I have them now. Their Savior. Their Messiah. Look at him now dead upon that cross. But God said, I have news for you. Because I still have one more move. And three days later, he rose again out of that tomb. Three days later, he walked the earth again. Three days later, he went out around teaching and preaching, reaching, going back to his apostles and saying, I live, and here's what you need to do. And he gave them instructions, and he gave them encouragement, and he gave them strength. And he says, and I want you to go, and I want you to go into, back into Jerusalem, and I want you to tarry there. He goes, because I've still got another move left. And they went back to Jerusalem, and they prayed together in that upper room. And that uh, fire fell from heaven upon all the 120 that were assembled there together. And God filled them with the Holy Ghost. Acts 1 and 8 says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and, and Samaria and, all, and all, to the uttermost part of the earth. I know I messed that one up. <laughs> but he still had another move left. Amen. And he put his power, because in Matthew 28, 20, and 28 and 18, I believe it is. He says, but all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. But you shall receive that power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Because he still had that move left. He still had that in his back pocket. He still had that as an opportunity for every one of us to be able to come to an altar to repent of our sins and be filled with that same power of the Holy Ghost. That he, God wasn't dead. He might have gone to that cross. He might have shed his blood for us on that Calvary. He might have died on that cross. They might have put him in a tomb. But three days later, he rose again, taking the keys of death, 
hell and the grave away from our enemy. He said he's no more power over these people. But when they come to an altar, when they give their lives to me, they shall have redemption. They shall have that next move in their life. Even for how bad our world is today, God is still waiting. He's still biding his time because he still has one more move. Right. Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse number 1, says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. I'm telling you today that the enemy has no power over your life. I'm telling you today that no matter how dark it gets out there, God's light still shines in this earth. God's light still shines through our lives. It still shines through his church to reach the lost of this world. And that no matter what goes on out there, no matter how bold the enemy gets, no matter how much he attacks our lives, God still has one move left. And that we read the back of the Bible and we win. He is not going to overcome us. He is not going to overtake our lives. He is not going to take us. And as Sister Z comes today and as we stand together, the enemy has no power over your life. 1 Timothy 4 and 10 says, Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men especially the, those that believe. I urge you today to believe. Believe in the power that is in Jesus' name. Amen. Believe in the power that can set every captive free. Yes. Open up any prison door. He can overcome any illness, any sickness that overcomes our lives because he is still in power and he is still on his throne and he still has a move to make in your life. No matter what you're facing today, God knows what it is. No matter what's going on in your life today, it's not too much for God to take care of. Whatever you're facing, let your trust be in Jesus alone and believe that he still has one more move. That's the good thing about Jesus. It's never going to be checkmate for Jesus. The devil can never get him cornered. The devil can never get him bound. The devil can never get him to a place where he's still not ever going to have one more move. This is not a game of chess. This is the game of life, of which Jesus is the giver of life and is in control of every life. Turn yours over to him today. Let him into every secret corner, every, every part of your life to him today. And trust in him that he can order your steps, that he can guide them, that he can bring you a better life. And that no matter, no trial, no pain, no hurt, nothing that you've endured in your past is too much for God to overcome. Because he's got another move. And it's waiting for you. I open up this altar today. If you need that move in your life today, if you need God to do something in your life today, I urge you to come to this altar. I urge you to get down on your knees or lift up your voice and your face to heaven and say, God, I need you because I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. I don't know how to get through this. I'm just going to put my trust in you, God, because you see the bigger picture. I'm going to put my trust in you, God, because you are the maker of all things. And I give it all to you today, Jesus.